Hey, what's up guys? Recently, I had the great opportunity to talk to one of the photographers that I look up to in landscapes and also one of my friends in landscape photography, Sean Bagshaw, and we did a live chat on YouTube and it's one of the things that I'm gonna try to be rolling out on the channel a lot more frequently, getting to talk to other photographers and getting them to share tips with you guys on how you can improve your landscape photography through online video. And me and Sean talked about a lot of different things here. We talked about how do you go into a location and shoot it for the first time, figure out how to make a great photo that way. We even talked about how to preserve locations and then using TK panels in post-processing with Photoshop. One of the things that Sean is a master at doing, so I was really excited about getting Sean Bagshaw to come on YouTube Live and talk to our channel about how he does things in landscape photography and then give some tips on how he shoots his photos. So let's get into the live chat and learn about exactly what Sean had to say. Boy, my favorite thing about photography is probably the fact that it's something creative and also the ability to be out hiking or physical or you know experiencing the outdoors at the same time. So kind of the marriage, I guess, of, of all that. I think when I was nine, my dad took me on uh, my first mountain climb. So we climbed up Mount Thielsen, up by Diamond Lake. It just blew my mind, being up that high, looking out, kind of the adventure and the excitement of it all. I kept getting out, backpacking. When I got to college, I learned to rock climb, started climbing Mount Shasta. And uh, my climbing partner, Rock Chuck, was taking photos and doing slideshows. And I just thought that was a really cool way to uh, kind of capture and share what we were doing. So I started taking photos and giving slideshows. Yeah, that was it. And eventually I, uh, you know, got old enough that now I just take photos and don't bother climbing the mountains. <laughs> when I first started, I was constantly looking at the photographs and thinking about the photographs that I was missing. But now I, I, I've been doing it long enough that when I'm out doing photography, I'm thinking about the photographs and thinking about the light. It's a much more balanced way of living when I'm not constantly uh, having anxiety about the photograph that I'm not getting. Instead, just focusing when I am photographing, making the best photographs that I can and really enjoying the photography time while that's the focus. And then when I'm doing other things, just be in the moment with those other things. I have a very uh, supportive and understanding family, um, which is great. Uh, but it's, it, it's been challenging at times, finding the right balance between uh, being out, doing the work, and uh, being home and spending time with the kids and, and the whole family. It took a few years. I think we're, we're dialing it in pretty good now. Oh, family video. Hey, Ray. Hey. Family selfie video. I live in a beautiful part of the world and there's so much to photograph here and I'm constantly reminded of, wow, I'm living in a place that people travel from other parts of the world to come here and see where I live. But I do enjoy getting to other parts of the world. It's fun to see something you've never seen before. It's, it's exciting to be in a different culture. It's exciting to see different landforms, different weather patterns, different people. So there's definitely something kind of energizing and exciting about hopping on a plane and, and going someplace where they, they, don't, they don't speak your language. 
probably the thing that inspires me the most is just being out, you know, getting in the car and heading somewhere. If I'm just outside, um, looking around, exploring, then eventually the inspiration comes and it always comes from just the experience I'm having. I guess the best advice I have is if you love photography or just, you know, creating anything, just do it as much and as often as you can and just, uh, you know, enjoy it for just the process of doing it. Don't worry about anything else. Don't worry about why you're doing it or what it's supposed to look like. Just do it and do it a lot and uh, enjoy it. Ever since I started landscape photography specifically in 2010, uh, someone that I've always learned a lot from and respected and, and kind of followed as a landscape photographer is, is Sean Bagshaw. And that's just because, I mean, he's been doing it for a long time. I'm not calling Sean old or anything, but he has been doing it a lot longer than me and knows a lot more about the process of landscape photography as well. And he's also an educator too. So I wanted to bring Sean on live and kind of do a live chat and, and talk about some issues and some things that you can learn in landscape photography to, to kind of take you to the next level, kind of get you thinking differently about landscape photography. And then also talk about some things that are hot topics in landscape photography, you know, preserving the landscape. Should you share landscapes and locations? And then lastly, we're going to get into TK panels. How do you use those? You know, what are some advantages of those for your post processing and, and how do you level up your post processing using TK panels? So Sean, what I want to know first is, is kind of fill us in on how you actually got started in landscape photography. Sure. Um, yeah, I, you know, I had no intention of, uh, of ever being a photographer. In fact, I didn't even know, uh, in the eighties and nineties, when I started getting into it, that photography was even really a, a thing you could do as a job or a career. Uh, the only reason I started taking pictures was I was, uh, in college, I got into rock climbing and I started doing mountaineering and going on expeditions, having adventures. And it was really just a completely, uh, um, it was kind of a, uh, just one of those things where I just want to show off. Basically I wanted, you know, I was doing these things that I thought was were really incredible and amazing and scary and whatever. Uh, I thought it was cool. And I just wanted other people to be able to see what I was doing. So I was just taking pictures of climbs and hikes and backpacks and um, mountain climbs and expeditions and things. And they kind of uh, grew as I went along. And then I'd come back and create a slideshow. This is back in the film days, slide projectors, the whole thing. And I'd corner whoever I could in a dark room with my slide projector and show them, you know, try to give them a, a really way too long, I'm sure really boring slideshow about some, some climb I did. But that was my whole purpose of uh, starting to take photos. But uh, when I did start taking photos, I noticed early on that, you know, out of maybe a bunch of, slides, maybe a couple hundred that I'd show people, there'd always be one or two that would kind of resonate. You know, I liked them and the audience also seemed to like them. And that got me thinking, it's like, okay, so if not all, I'm doing the same thing to take all my photos. I don't know what I'm doing, but certain images just are more appealing or interesting than others. So why is that? What is it that makes a good image? And how can I do it more frequently? You know, how can I get better at that? And that really got me into this idea of Oh, let's learn photography proper. You know, let's actually figure out how to be good at this. Uh, and that just set me on my way. And eventually, after a few years of doing that, I noticed that I was planning trips into the mountains, not to climb them, but to take photos of them. And photography became the uh, kind of the main focus. And then that eventually led me into doing photography, you know, as my career. Now, you were you were a teacher before that. What what grades did you teach and, and how has that really helped you as a photographer and, and as a photographer educator? So I was a middle school science and math teacher. I taught middle school for about, I think it was almost 12 years, around 12 years. Um, loved it. Loved being a, a teacher. It was great. I uh, loved the kids. Um, and it, I think, you know, when I first 
changed from being a teacher and started my photography business, people asked me, are you going to teach photography? And at that time I said, no way. First of all, I, I don't feel qualified at this point to teach anything about photography. I'm still figuring it out myself. Um, but also I just feel like, felt like, yeah, I did my teaching thing. I'm going into photography because I want to do something different now. After about, I don't know, probably six, eight, 10 years of doing my photography business, um, you know, I was getting requests from people to teach them photography. And eventually I gave in and said, all right, uh, I'll teach some photography. I'm really glad I did. Uh, it's a big part of my business as a photographer now. And yeah, the teaching, I think the skills I learned in the classroom, uh, being able to, especially for middle school kids, you know, having to keep things uh, interesting, having to boil it down to the, you know, the essentials, be able to deliver the information clearly and succinctly, but also in a way that's, you know, kind of fun and entertaining. All of those things I think are really coming over and helping me out with my teaching and my video tutorials and all that stuff. Now, like when you're teaching people, do you kind of see a little bit of yourself in them, how, how they're going out when they're first starting out and trying to figure it out trial by error and, and kind of figuring it out seeing what photos work best and why yeah i i see a lot you know i see all different types and and it's amazing how many different uh ways people approach photography i think that's just an example of how different people are which is great um myself i'm a person who i am a trial by you know error you know uh, you know, make mistakes, just try stuff. Don't, don't really worry too much about it. Just learn uh, from your mistakes um, and, and get out there and do it. I was never a person who actually took classes in photography or did workshops or anything like that. I didn't learn. I did learn from others, but it was very self-directed because I just, I'm someone who likes to figure stuff out. Uh, so I see all the whole range. I see people like that, but I also see people that are, um, much more tentative and worried about doing something wrong. And that's one of the things I try to teach is, you know, especially nowadays that we're not shooting on film. There's, there's no, once you have the equipment, you know, there's no um, real investment that you're, that you're worried about in terms of just trying stuff, just try lots of things. And if it doesn't work, what's the big deal? And I see people getting really uh, anxious about not doing it right, whatever that is. Um, and I see other people that really like to learn from others as opposed to kind of beating their head against the wall like I do. They don't want to spend a year figuring something out. They'd rather go to the person who already did that and just say, you know, in 10 minutes, just explain this to me so I can just do it. I don't want to have to go through all that, you know, pain and suffering of figuring it out myself. So, yeah, we, I see the whole, the whole spectrum and it's great. It's really fun to have all the different learning styles. Obviously, YouTube is a really great place to go if you're starting out in photography or you want to learn like a specific technique or learn about gear. But it seems to me like YouTube is really geared towards gear reviews or te post-processing techniques that you can do. Not only are they easy to make, but they're easy to follow when you're on the computer yourself. But I really want to hit on things people can do in the field and actually shooting. So if somebody is going out in the field, say to a new location uh, that they're going to for the first time, what are some things that they can do stepping into that scenario? Um, things you can do going into the field the first time. I, that can be, I, I'm sure, the most intimidating is just where do I go? And once I get there, what do I do? Um, for me, my photography has always been about the experiences first. Like I was climbing and I was doing all these outdoor uh, adventures, ex explorations, and those that was the reason. And the photography came later. So maybe one piece of advice is if you want to be an outdoor photographer, just get outdoors and bring your camera with you. And then, you know, when opportunities present themselves, uh, you've got the camera there and you can you can capture it. But I think if you, when you head out with the expe expectation that you're going to make photos, um, then that kind of changes the whole relationship to what you're doing. And it becomes less about the experience and more about how am I going to get a good photo out of this? And I kind of try to always do it differently. I'm going out to appreciate 
the place I am or to see something new or to be in a place for a certain kind of lighting event or weather event or whatever, you know, I'm going to go out into a snowstorm or I'm going to be out at sunrise or sunset or whatever. And I have my camera with me. And if, if something looks photogenic, then great, I'll shoot it. But I go out and have adventures all the time where I don't make any good photos. And I also go out a lot and don't even bring the camera because I just want to have that, that experience in the outdoors without the, you know, involving the photography aspect. So that would be my first bit of advice is just get outside, bring your camera with you, see what happens. Um, watch, look, listen, really, you know, be aware of what's going on and what might be worth taking a photo of. Again, for landscape photography, I think this maybe the second tip I could give is um, just bring a tripod, set up the camera on the tripod, and then just take it slow. And that's the great thing about landscape photography is it is can be very slow. You can set up, find your composition, you know, spend an hour just working the composition on the tripod. And then once that's set, now you can take all the time you want to think about your focus, your depth of field, uh, work through if you're learning all the different things that you can control in your camera, uh, you have lots of time to work with those and experiment. Try shooting different f-stops for different depth of field. Try shooting at different exposures to see, uh, you know, and shutter speed uh, times to see what the effects are. Um, just test out everything. Test out different lenses and then go back home and learn from all that testing and don't worry right from the beginning about, you know, getting the perfect shot the first time you go out. I guess those those two things and a lot of, you know, those kind of relate. It's like just get out, learn, practice, try things. And over the process of doing that, a lot of that, you know, the the specifics of how to get that good photo more often, those that just falls into place with practice. Yeah, I would say too, like trying places out and figuring out what works. Like a lot of times if you're going into a location that maybe someone else has shot or you've never been to or anything like that, you're gonna do some research firsthand and, and you may have a picture in mind of what it could look like. But really going beyond that initial shot, uh, taking that shot, seeing what works, but then trying to figure out, you know, what, what other places here might work. Uh, going beyond that initial is usually what kind of takes you into a more thoughtful photo and, and even a more creative photo, at least in my experience personally. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, I think the research, like you said, that's really important. And I'm always, if I'm going someplace new, they haven't been before, I'm definitely doing a lot of research, looking at what other photos have been taken in that place. I'm always excited actually, if there's a place I'm going to and I can't find a lot of photos, <laughs> then I'm excited because I know that, uh, you know, maybe there's a lot of potential there hasn't been photographed like crazy. But these days and with 8 billion people on the planet, <laughs> those places are rare. So, but doing the research, seeing what's there, getting some ideas ahead of time is great. But I agree with you is once you're there, now it's time to react to what the actual conditions are and what your actual interests are, you know, creatively as a photographer. Um, and instead of just going down and plunking down your tripod in that exact spot where you saw the photo, um, I mean, and maybe you do that too, and that's a great starting point, but then start looking around. And I always follow the light. You know, I get to a place and I look, where's the light interesting to me? And that's what always dictates my photographs. Um, for example, and I always use this in, in my workshops, I'll talk about, you know, I could show up at the rim of the Grand Canyon and here's this, you know, you know, wonder of nature in front of me. But if the light isn't looking good in the Grand Canyon, but there's a bush behind me and that's where the light event is really amazing. I'm the guy turning the other way from the Grand Canyon, taking pictures of the bush. And you don't even know that I'm at the Grand Canyon, but that's not the point. Um, now, if the light in the Grand Canyon looks great, then uh, shoot that. And that determines how I'm gonna shoot it, you know? So when you get in places, follow the light, number one. Always look behind you. That's another one. I'm always looking in all directions because a lot of times you hike in with that kind of forward focus and sometimes the best photo is behind you. And, um, you know, trust, trust your instincts. 
some of my best photos were made on the side of a road somewhere where I'd never been before. I was just driving down the road and saw something through the windshield and decided to pull into the ditch and see if it would make a photo. And, you know, those are the photos you don't research. You have no idea that that's going to happen and you got to catch it in the moment. What, what are some of the tools that you're using? We talked about planning locations very briefly. What are some of the tools you're using to, before you get into the field, plan out kind of what you're going to see and, and maybe your initial plan of photographing a place is going to be? Right. Boy, these days, it's amazing. Compared to when I started, the resources that we have available both before you go and even, you know, like if you have any sort of a phone signal in the field, the research you can do on the spot, on location in real time is just incredible. It's totally changed the game. One of the reasons we see so many great photos these days is because of the tools we have to research. But for me, um, obviously just doing image searches on the, on the web is a big one. So Google image searches, Flickr image searches, uh, 500px image searches, uh, just to see what else is out there. That's a great way, obvious. Uh, Google Earth is spectacular. You can go to any place on the planet and zoom in to and stand on the ground and look around and see what things actually look like before you even get there. So, you know, it's kind of like, oh, I think there's a lake here in this place and there's a mountain over there. I wonder if you can see the mountain from the lake Google Earth, you can go to that lake and see if you can see the mountain or not. And sometimes I go, oh my gosh, that is the perfect view. That's where I'm going to go check that out. Or, oh darn, when you're at the lake, there's a ridge that blocks the mountain. You can't even see the mountain from there. Yeah, probably not going to go, or at least I'm not going to go to that lake for the purpose of, you know, taking a photo of the mountain. Um, boy, there are tide, you know, the apps that you can have on your phone. So, you know, tide apps, so you know the tides any day of the year on any location, weather apps. Um, there's a great uh, sunset and sunrise prediction website now that, you know, it's still computer models and it's still a prediction, but it kind of gives you an idea of what your chances are, maybe seeing some good light at uh, morning or night. Um, photo pills, uh, and I know the guys at photo pills are awesome. That is a massive, it's just a phone app, but it's a massive resource that can, you can plan out, you know, everything you need to know about the sun and the moon and light and location and where you want to stand and what lens to use and all of that before you even get to a place. So yeah, all of that I use. Yeah, I think I would probably pay like 50 bucks for photo pills, the amount that it actually does for you as a photographer. I think it's like $10 now, right now, to download on your phone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, don't tell Raphael that, old Jack. No. <laughs> it, yeah, I, I, agree. I agree with you. It's, it's, uh, it's an amazing amount of uh, value for, for the cost. Yeah, I'll link that below in the video description too. Um, switching gears though, when you get into a location, there's a big movement right now especially by photographers and, and outdoor photographers of preserving places. Um, there's some pushback on that from other people about like you must reveal locations and it's kind of this sticky situation. How do you go into the field, plan out your shots, know where the best light is, but also maintain and preserve those locations for people who are going in after you? Yeah, this has become a a really big issue, something that I've seen over the course of uh, my photography over the last couple of 20, 30 years, whatever that's been, um, really change. It used to be there were just a very few of us photo geeks out there. And so, you know, as many photographers that want to photog photograph a place, it really wasn't a problem because there's, you know, there's only going to be five of us. <laughs> but now we've got thousands or millions of people out there wanting to go to these places and get photographs of them. And just as a matter of reality is a lot of places in nature can't handle that much traffic, even if people are being as careful as they can be um, just that much foot traffic, just it, 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 it doesn't, doesn't work. Um, so how do you, what do you do about that? First of all, the, you know, this idea that you have to um, give your uh, disclosed locations and things, for, there's no rules in photography. As a photographer, you can do whatever you want. 
Uh, there's, there's, there's no set of laws around photography. I mean, there's laws that we all have to abide by, but um, yeah, you're under no obligation to say where you took a photo. Uh, number one. Number two, I would say that, um, you know, there's obvious places that everyone knows about. Um, they're set up to have a lot of uh, foot traffic or a lot of visitation. They're not at all hard to find out about, you know. Um, they're right on a road or from a parking lot or a established paved and railing viewpoint, things like that. So I, I generally don't have too much trouble sharing information about that. And when it comes to sharing information about other locations, yeah, I generally don't just put it out on the internet, you know, just available like that, you know. Um, but, you know, for individuals who I talk to, who I know, who are interested, you know, it's still, I feel great to share that stuff um, with my friends and colleagues um, and, and just individuals who I come across. Um, but I also am very uh, committed to talking about, yeah, like you said, what, what makes, you know, how do you not have an impact on a place? The number one way is don't have a bunch of people go there. <laughs> the more people that go, no matter what you do, there's gonna be an impact. Um, so beyond keeping the numbers low, uh, for me, I try to stay off anything living whether it's animal life, you know, at the beach, you've got barnacles and uh, mussels and things growing on the rocks, sea anemones and things. Uh, if I can't step on bare rock, then I don't step on it. Uh, same thing uh, in the landscape. If I'm in a place where there's uh, fragile plant life, I try to walk on dirt or I try to walk on rock. Um, obviously grasses and things like that, they're gonna grow back every year. But there's a lot of, especially in alpine environments and other places, a lot of the plant life is barely hanging on to life as it is. And one step and it's, you know, now that plant is not coming back. So being really careful about where I walk, um, following all guidelines when you're in a place. If there's a trail and it says stay on the trail, stay on the trail. I know it's tempting to get off, um, you know, and if there's an area that's closed, it's closed. If you need a permit to go to a place, get the permit, uh, that kind of stuff. So those are all things that I think about. It's a tricky and really multi-layered topic, but anyway, that's that's kind of the, the general gist. Yeah, it's it's kind of like what you said. If if you can't be on a dirt path, you probably shouldn't step on it. If, if you're going into a place that is wide enough for your boot, going down the trail you probably shouldn't bring a group of 12 people out there uh, to walk on the same trail with you and and sharing that location there's there's a lot of pushback on sharing locations too but sharing a location doesn't have to be like sharing the exact gps coordinates it can be sharing okay this was shot in Zion National Park. Uh, that's a big space of land that people can go and explore on their own within the rules. Um, but also, I think sharing in a way that educates people on a national park's fragility, because, I mean, social media is not going anywhere. Um, I think we can all agree and, and figure that out as big as it is and how we all share information. Um, but switching the way maybe you share a photo, um, some of the steps that you took maybe at the end of the post or in the middle of a post about what steps you took to preserve the place that you were actually going to shoot in. Yeah. And um, yeah, and I, I, I think that's, uh, that's the approach I am taking more and more these days, talking generally about, yeah, I, that was in Zion National Park or that was in the, uh, the coast range of Northern California. And anyone can go to the coast range in Northern California and drive up and down dirt roads and hike trails and do whatever, just the same way I did, you know, but to say, oh, you go to this parking lot and then you hike up this trail to this exact point, um, even without the environmental problems with, with, you know, sending the hordes of people to an exact spot like that, um, 
to me, part of the, the interest and the fun of this is having the adventure and having the exploration and discovering things for yourself, not just following, you know, the steps that somebody wrote down in the cookbook for you. So just uh, just on that principle alone, I, I agree. Like, yeah, go out and adventure. Here are some areas to go see what you see. And a lot of times when you go and do that, you actually find something more interesting and more meaningful to you personally than uh, than that place you saw a picture of once. Okay, let's switch gears again. Let's talk about TK panels, uh, some of the stuff that you're absolutely an expert on. Um, I mean, I'm a beginner in all of this, understanding TK panels and like, I'm just about keeping it simple as possible, but I see the advantages to using TK panels and bringing out very specific, subtle things within your photos that can really step them up to the next level. So talk about some of the effects and some of the advantages that people can get out of using TK panels and, and maybe going into it for the first time with the right mindset. Sure. Well, first, just for anyone who doesn't know, uh, TK Actions uh, are, are uh, produced by Tony Kuiper. That's the TK. So Tony Kuiper, back in 2006, kind of, uh, well, they didn't discover them because they were always there, but he learned about this idea of uh, luminosity mass in Photoshop and started, he was really the first guy who was applying luminosity mass in the way that we use them today to landscape photography. And he also started building actions so that people could access these these masks quickly more quickly and easily and that's really developed over uh, the last uh, boy it's been you know what are we 14 13 14 years now since he first started that um, so basically what TK actions is it's a plug-in for Photoshop and the reality is it's all stuff that Photoshop can do already but uh, unless you really know the the ins and outs and the, the secret back doors of Photoshop and have tons of time to sit and hand uh, create these various uh, processes on your own, you just like to do that, probably no one's going to actually utilize these things, but they're extremely powerful. And so that's what the TK Actions plugin does. It gives you a quick, easy way to access um, these things, we, we call them found masks. Actually, I heard that from Aaron Bobnick, uh, called them found masks. They're masks that Photoshop can generate if you know how to get it to do it. And that includes luminosity masks, which are masks that are based on the brightness values in the image. It also includes color range masks, which are masks based on the colors in the image. There's saturation masks. Um, there's uh, frequency masks. There's all different types of these found masks. Um, and really the power of Photoshop comes from uh, layers, selections, and masks. Those are the three things that makes Photoshop really different than other image editing software. Um, that's what enables you to, like you said, pinpoint really subtle adjustments to very refined parts of the image. Um, and then if you can access some of these specialized types of masks, the ability to really get refined adjustments goes, you know, it's, it's there, you just can't do it any other way in any other software. Um, so for example, how might that work out for, uh, in Photoshop? If there is uh, a certain tone in an image that I feel, okay, the, the highlights are a little too bright, you know, uh, or a little too whatever I think they are, I can create a mask so I can make an adjustment that goes just to those areas of the image that I feel have that, that issue. And it doesn't affect all the parts of the image. Cause that's one of the problems with a lot of our adjustments is you adjust the thing that there's a problem with, but then the rest of the image adjusts along with it. And so you got one thing solved, but you created other problems for yourself. But with the right mask, you can say, I'm just gonna adjust that issue and leave the rest of my image alone. Now, with less refined mask, there's lots of ways to make masks in, in Photoshop. You know, you can hand paint a mask or you can draw a selection and make a mask that way. But a lot of times those masks, they work, but other times they're just not refined enough. They leave a halo or you can clearly see the edge. And that's the problem, you know, in, in our image developing. 
what makes good developing is you can't tell that it's there. You don't, you're not aware of it. You can't see where the edge of the adjustment is, or there's no haloing or, you know, that kind of stuff. So luminosity masks, because they work with the tones in the image and they match the image pixel for pixel, they don't have any of those problems. They, they don't have edges that are visible. They don't create halos. Um, yeah. So that's, I don't know if that makes any sense. It's a, it's a, it's a complex topic, but yeah, like TK panels and, and TK actions are, like you said, developed by Tony Kuiper. Um, but how, how do people go about finding the panels and the education um, that, that you produce on that? Sure. Well, you can go to my website, which is, I'm, you can link to it, <laughs> I'm sure, in the show notes. Um, it's outdoorexposurephoto.com. You can just search for Sean Bagshaw on, on Google and you'll find my website. Or you can go to Tony Kuiper's website. We both have uh, essentially the same stuff available. So Tony is the guy who designs, codes, and creates the, uh, the panels. And I produce the education for it because when you first look at it, it looks like there's a lot there. And luminosity mass stuff just kind of getting the concepts down is a little tricky, but once you get moving in it, um, it really uh, it falls into place and then you quickly begin using it, um, I think pretty seamlessly in your workflow. Um, the great thing about the panel now too, is it does so much more besides just creating masks. I mean, that's when he, his very first version of, of his panel, all it did was make masks for you, which is great. But even if you're never going to use a luminosity mask, the TK Actions panel is excellent to get because it also does just a ton of other things that you want that photographers are going to do in Photoshop anyway. But they're all buried in like menus and sub menus and other panels, or you have to know the keyboard shortcut and remember that. And you know, knowing or or there's sometimes there's just complex procedures that are tricky to do. For example, um, applying like um, some sort of a soft glow effect. You know, if you're a advanced or experienced Photoshop user, you may know all the steps to apply that. Um, but if you're not, his panel also can quickly generate some of those advanced um, techniques for you. So even if you're never going to use a luminosity mask or a color range mask or any of that stuff, um, just for the, the help of speeding up your workflow, being able to do things in Photoshop that you may not have even known were there otherwise, um, and things like that. The panel is, so the panel is really good for beginners, anyone. So we'll, we'll link all that below in the video description too, for you guys to check out. If you want to look at TK panels, if you want to look at Sean's website or Tony's website, we'll link those below too. And the, the tutorials for those, we'll link some of those below too, for you to check out. Sean, what do you have coming up the rest of this year as we progress? I mean, we're only in March. We have several months left. Like, are you doing more workshops this year? What do you got going on? Uh, I've got a few more workshops. I mean, I've got a few workshops kind of scattered throughout the year. I don't do a ton of workshops uh, just because I got so much other stuff going on. Uh, but I usually do a, a few in any given year. Uh, I already did an awesome one in, in the Dolomites with uh, Aaron Bobnick in February, which was spectacular. Just finished one on the Oregon coast with David Cobb. They're both uh, members of Photo Cascadia with me. Uh, my teammates there, I work a lot with them. Uh, in April, I have a, uh, a printing workshop, how to produce good prints. <laughs> We're gonna do that uh, in combination with, uh, or in, in collaboration with HD Aluminum, which is kind of the premier uh, aluminum printing lab. Um, I'm gonna do that with Zach Schnepf. And then Zach and I also have a, a landscape uh, workshop in Bend, Oregon in June. And then I'm also going, I have a workshop in Switzerland uh, with Christian Hebe in September. Those are all filled up at this point, um, but, uh, but those are coming up. I'm also um, presenting at a bunch of conferences and stuff this year. Uh, see what I have coming up in July. I have the um, New England Council of Camera Clubs uh, conference in Massachusetts. And then let's see what I, oh, I'm doing one in Ireland in uh, October. Um, that one information will be coming on that later. And then also I'm going to do the Out of Oregon conference in Newport, Oregon. Uh, that's part of the Out of Chicago conference series. Uh, that's coming up in October also. 
Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Sean, and, and sharing your tips on how to produce great photos, both in the field, stepping into a location for the first time, and then also in post-processing using the TK panels and actions. And then uh, all the stuff you have coming up later this year, we'll link below in the show notes and the video description as well. But uh, thank you so much for coming on and, and doing a live chat with us. Thanks, David. It's always fun talking to you. And uh, yeah, I always enjoy talking about this great thing we do. So we covered a lot of basics in this live chat. I wanna thank Sean for coming on again and talking to us about how to level up your landscape photography, take better photographs whenever you're going out and shoot landscapes. If you wanna to subscribe to Sean's channel, again, all the links we talked about are below in the video description. You can easily subscribe to Sean's channel. Click or tap your screen on this side. If you wanna easily subscribe to my channel, click or tap your screen on this side. Thanks so much guys and keep shooting.